challenges huh? at that time. Uh, this was like, I guess, two years ago, uh, if I'm not mistaken, either in 2017 or 2018, or maybe it's 2017. So we have about uh, uh, eight more minutes to go. Um, how many has uh, registered? Uh, now, um, F31. Hmm? Huh? Yeah. Titi. Um. Uh. Tak. Uh, tak ada gambar. <laughs> huh? Tolong, because that. Nah. Huh. I am using my smartphone, brother Sharan. How oh. do I? You know, I switch on. I can't switch it on. Okay, now it's. <laughs> huh? Like I'm speaking to a wall. Eh? <laughs> I can. I can. Huh? I can't see your anybody. Video also from your smartphone. Maybe. Come again, Prof. Uh, come again, Brother Sharan. We sh we we should see your your video. I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe. Can you see me or not? No. We can hear you very clear. Yeah, but yeah, but you can't see me. Uh, I'll ask my daughter to switch on the phone. I'm trying to. How do I go? I I will have to. Go back to Zoom. Is it? How do I? How do I go there? How do I go to the site? Hmm. Um, no, I can't. Nobody is allowing me. I can hear you, Prof. Zaliha, but I cannot see you, Prof. <laughs> but I can follow, actually, I can follow your travel to Istanbul and your travel with uh, Sister Dr. Fatima Abdullah. So how is she now, uh, her health is okay, Prof. Fatima, uh, Dr. Fatima Abdullah. Prof. Zaleha, lock out for a while, uh, Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, Prof. Fatima is doing great, alhamdulillah. I spoke yeah. with her this morning. She is here. She is uh, in, in KL. In KL, right? Yes. Uh, her, their house just behind uh, university. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Alhamdulillah, the, the funeral went so smooth. Within seven hours, everything is done. He, he passed away around 3.30 by 11. Yes. Yes. 11 now things are uh, completed already. Yeah. Uh, where, 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 where is the funeral? Uh, at the campus, campus cemetery. We have a cemetery. Oh, Next to the, yeah, in the hill, yeah? Yeah, in the hill. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Normally, during COVID, uh, it will take two days for the remains to be released. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because uh, you have to be, doesn't matter you are normal death or whatever. Mm. They will uh, take your sample and send it for testing. Mm. But Alhamdulillah, last night, Prof is so smooth. <laughs> so maybe the brothers managed to do it. Yeah, yeah. He was... Uh, Dismissed by hospital already during uh, the morning or day before. So he passed away uh, at home. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's a great loss yeah, to us. Yeah? It's a great loss of the, in the Islamization, especially in the Islamic psychology. Uh, the Indonesian brothers and sisters they feel so sad because of his, uh, his demise, yeah? MashaAllah. We are, yeah. 
How was the Pak Nasir conference, Pak Abib? It's going well? Oh, it's great. It's great with the great participants and also attention. But, you know, uh, uh, the younger brother, the younger brother Pak Siddiq called me that he, he could not follow because he was on the way. So he asked me about the... Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, he is the, the vice chair. He is vice chairman of the Dewan Dakwah, uh -huh. Dr. Uh, Nur, Muhammad Nur, the younger brother, Pak Siddiq. Uh -huh. I hope that there will be what to call follow up of the translation uh, into English, uh, all of the work of uh, Pak Natsir. You know, Brother Saharan, Pak Nasir actually the one who suggested me to study philosophy in Gajah Mada. Masya Allah. Otherwise, I will be in Saudi, ah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he told me we should learn philosophy and social science. Masya so Allah. send me to Professor Rasidi, Professor ah. Dr. Rasidi, and then send me to the uh, grandfather of of uh, uh, Rashidan, governor, uh, grandfather, uh, Rashid Baswedan, uh, his father of... Assalamualaikum. 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 How are you? Alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> yes, Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Bikhair. Alhamdulillah, Brother Shahran has been helping us a lot in getting... So uh, we are now uh, have people from all over the globe, huh? Yeah. Yes. MashaAllah. Through registration, there's 40 countries coming in. Yeah. But I was uh, wondering as well whether there will uh. be the same number for the program. <laughs> The real, on the real day. Yeah, Brother Shaharan has all this uh, global, global. Uh, oh, yes, we have this online class, bro. And all these brothers registered. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, good. so we just plug in in the database. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. Inshallah. We share it with our, we share it in Indonesia with our groups uh, in the universities, in the uh -huh. study center. Yes, yes, thank you very yeah, much. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Habib. I mean, uh, I was told that the, the Indonesians constitute the biggest uh, group, huh? Right. <laughs> we see, tan we see uh, Tansri Ramli Talib in the video. <laughs> <laughs> They're our close friend of Prof. <laughs> yes. Oh, Tansri, uh, how are you? I know, he's very, he's, he's he's very loyal to the program. <laughs> And she always there. Yeah, good. You can unmute yourself, Tansri. I see uh, Puan Aisha. Uh, how many how many participants now, uh, Brother Shahran? Now we have uh, 67. Oh, that's 67. Yeah, 67. It's more is coming. Yeah. You can get around 150 normally. Yeah, normally, yeah. Okay, Prof. It's uh, three o'clock. Uh, uh, yeah, you yes, can. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, oh, I can start for one thirty second, bro. I'll call you. Okay. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, this is just technical thing. Uh, everyone will be muted throughout the session. Uh, we will take question from uh, chat box. I uh, will communicate with Prof. Zaleha as the moderator. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, upload the video uh, to this tag, uh, Facebook and this tag, Web TV and also our variety online class. So without further ado, we invite our dear Professor Dr. Fri Zaleha to moderate the session. Okay, thank you, Brother Sharan. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, the grace of Allah. Uh, today we managed to uh, kick up our uh, .net at its back. Um, I think there's anything for Brother Shaban. Uh. Yeah. 
Go ahead, Prof. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the writing lab at this tech, uh, was born out of an aspiration to improve the writing skills of students and staff at this tech. Uh, and we have started uh, since January 2021, very recent. Feedback from the ISTEC community showed a great desire to increase their writing skills with an expectation that this would be this would help them in their studies and publications. So we strive to develop distinction in our services to adoption of global writing standards and feedback from students. And we are very happy that Brother Shahran is helping us to get students from all over the world. And we were told that um, uh, students from uh, over 40 countries um, have registered for this uh, program today. And uh, we hope with the active development and review coming from our students will consistently uh, be uh, conducted on our innovative services to foster an open and welcoming learning environment for all uh, writers. So this is a, a necessary skill. So the writing lab is, uh, at the moment, is a free service for students which runs workshops, tutorials, one-on-one -on -one tutorials, support sessions to enhance academic writing and research skills. So the services are available specifically for postgraduate students of ISTEC, but we will be thinking as well to offer this to the world. And uh, for the first try, we are involving uh, eight professors at ISTEC, uh, of which they will contribute their expertise to donating their workout time. So because everything is workout, so you, the participants will not have to pay, and um, the professors are uh, also not putting any pay uh, because this is run in uh, Waka. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, to today with us is a very distinguished uh, scholar, uh, which actually I do not have to introduce, but for new students at the uh, the first uh, speaker for our writing lab at this time is Professor Emeritus Dr. Dr. Osman Baka, uh, who, is, uh, who is a PhD scholar in Islamic philosophy. He has authored and edited 39 books and published numerous articles in the areas of history and philosophy of Islamic power, history of Islamic civilization, Islamic theology and philosophy, Civilizational Studies, Comparative Religion, Religion and Science, Interreligious Dialogue and Islam in Southeast Asia. Uh, I have to limit myself in this um, uh, introduction because we would like to hear directly from him uh, on a talk entitled Epistemology, Theory and Practice. So without further ado, may I kindly invite uh, Prof. Osman. So the floor is yours, Prof. Please. You have uh, about one hour, Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dr. Sri Zaleha Kamaruddin, the moderator, uh, Brother Sharan and um, every one of you. Uh, first of all, before I proceed, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, bro, we hear clearly. Yes? Yeah, yeah, very clear. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, I want, I want to make sure that uh, what, what happens to one professor, uh, not realizing that uh, in two hours of a lecture, this. Uh, um, laptop was muted, you know? Only live after that. <laughs> it won't happen to me, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Uh, this is a nice PowerPoint. <laughs> yes, yes, all right. Uh, yes, the uh, 
first of all, I want to yes. really I want to express my appreciation to Professor Zaleha for taking this uh, initiative, very very important initiative uh, in organizing this uh, series of um, uh, this uh, uh, tech labs. Uh, so. So the uh, I volunteer. I say okay. I can start the first one, and uh, I requested uh, to be given the opportunity to speak about epistemology uh, because um, uh, based on my uh, experience of uh, uh, more than 40 years uh, supervising uh, teaching, uh, I think I can have some grasp of the uh, what are the uh, peculiar uh, issues, you know. Uh, that are faced by, by, by students especially. But um, I want to emphasize here that epistemology is a very, very important field of study. Now, you all have heard the term, and I'm sure also you have read uh, about it uh, in different contexts. Uh, but uh, I still feel that um, uh, I would like to speak about the topic uh, and, and my, 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 please get, don't get me wrong, I don't want you to get the impression that um, in this presentation, as a result of this one hour of presentation and the other uh, hour of uh, uh, questions, um, yes, by the end of the day, then uh, you'll be able to, uh, in, in the sense that your uh, capacity, your uh, capability of writing a good thesis, for example, uh, is enhanced. No, I don't have that impression because um, I don't think with this one single lecture uh, could be of much uh, a contribution. Uh, but uh, I hope you do follow the series of um, uh, lectures to be given by my other colleagues. Uh, but uh, hopefully, um, after this program today, uh, I would uh, like that um, uh, your mind has become, uh, it has broadened. Uh, in other words, um, there are some issues that may be uh, that, that um, uh, has been classified. Uh, so if I can achieve that, I'm quite happy. Yeah? In other words, um, to come up with, um, uh, with a mind that is able to realize a bigger picture of the, the whole field of knowledge. So I call my talk uh, today epistemology, theory, and practice. Uh, all right. So what is epistemology? What is epistemology? Well, let's go to the etymological definition. Why important to start with etymological definition? Because etymological definition means that we are going to the original meaning of the word as used in, in the first language in which it was it was used. Uh, obviously, you know that this term uh, originated from ancient Greek civilization, right? Uh, so the word epistemology itself is um, derived from a combination of two words. Episteme means knowledge, and the other one is logos, right? Now, logos is a word that has undergone um, a lot of changes uh, in its meaning, but I said we want to go to the original. Now, actually, in the ancient Greek culture, the word logos refers to more to divine thought, what is the mind of God rather than what is in the human mind, right? But now it is used in the sense of both. It was, uh, logos refers, uh, logos still maintains theological um, meaning, as for example, the Christian logos, for example. Um, uh, and of course, uh, for some people, the word has been secularized uh, to give a purely uh, human uh, content to the word logos. But um, my own understanding of the original meaning is that logos is just difficult to organize thought. Initially, it's divine organized thought. So, which means that combining the word knowledge plus organized thought, what we have, the original meaning of uh, open is 
thought or knowledge, right? So it's just something like, all right, I ask, what are your thoughts on knowledge? So the question is uh, an epistemological question, all right? So that is the, the, the etymological definition. Now next, um, yes. So what is the importance of etymological definition? What is the importance? Uh, is it just because I just want to just to inform you of this etymological definition, but there's some importance on that. Yes, it is important, especially for some fields of study where you encounter concepts, terminologies of various kinds, uh, knowing the original meaning or the etymological meaning will be good because uh, comparing what was originally understood, what is currently understood, you actually come and have, a, uh, have some idea of what kind of historical development the meaning, uh, the meaning has undergone. And so I call it's important to semantics. Huh? It is important to semantics. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, to the history uh, of ideas and even to conceptual definition because the difference between uh, not necessarily but often there is a difference between etymological definition and conceptual definition etymological definition refers to the original meaning based on the original meaning uh, epistemologists philosophers educationists have come up with new concepts based on that etymological meaning so there's a difference yeah I come to that, well, but, but important, it's important. Uh, semantics, of course, that, that is important. Uh, as I said, semantic field, uh, if you want to, 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 to understand the development in the semantic field, so semantic is something to do with, uh, with, uh, with meaning. Now, the, so, uh, but now, since our concern is more from the Islamic, perspective, we want to talk about uh, epistemology from the Islam perspective. So I ask the, quest, the, the question, so why is the significance uh, of this etymological definition when viewed from the uh, Islamic perspective? Which means, of course, uh, in the Arabic context, because the, that was the original uh, scholarly language uh, of Islam, uh, the, the Arabic. So, uh, to talk about etymological definition in the Islamic perspective would mean that we are going to that uh, unique character about the Arabic language. We go to the uh, triliteral roots, all right? In other words, you know, the, the, the standard, we say, we say, fa'ain, lam, fa'ala, so that, that, that is those three letters, so the, uh, the, the, the three letters. Uh, the three letters again, of, of, of the words, and then from that you have so many uh, different possibilities. You have fi'lun, uh, uh, you have fa'il, uh, yeah, uh, and so on. So the, uh, and, 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 the, and uh, the or this original meaning will tell us about the semantic feel of a particular word in, in Arabic. And um, you know very well, uh, uh, semantic issues mean you're concerned about meaning. Ma'ana, right? The meaning. Uh, so that's why you have the, for example, um, Professor Said Muhammad Nakib and Atta's definition uh, of knowledge uh, when he said, knowledge is the arrival, uh, in the soul of the meaning, ma'ana, of a thing or an object of knowledge. So, so why is knowledge? So he said, from the perspective of God, uh, Define or that object of knowledge. Viewed from the viewpoint of the soul of the individual, it will be the arrival uh, of the soul at the meaning. See, the arrival of soul, which is usul. So, usul and usul. And this, um, you can refer to Professor Anantas uh, definition uh, of knowledge in Islam uh, and secularism in the paper 
that he presented in the 1977 conference uh, in, in, in Mecca. All right? So etymology is a very important integral component of epistemology. So epistemology term is the broader concept which includes etymology. So etymology and epistemology are not constitute uh, different um, uh, fields uh, or different semantic, uh, but rather etymology is a particular aspect of epistemology. Now we go to the, as I said, from, from etymological definition, we go to conceptual definition. Right? In, it happens that etymological definition is the same as conceptual definition. But in some cases, that is not the case. So, for example, as I said just now, etymological meaning, epistemology just means that some thoughts, some thoughts about knowledge. Right? But in the conceptual definition, it is more pronounced. You don't say just some thoughts about knowledge, say a theory of knowledge, right? Theory of knowledge. Uh, and uh, let us not forget that in English, the word um, theory uh, is derived from the Greek word theoria. And theoria in original Greek, it means vision, wawasan, wawasan ilmu. Epistemology, yela wawasan ilmu. Epistemology is vision of knowledge. So some of us wish to be uh, narrower than some others, for example, or the theory of knowledge, the vision of knowledge in Islamic civilization is wider, is broader than the vision uh, of knowledge in some other civilization, for example, right? So, but my point here is this, then uh, if you, because we cannot agree, yeah, we cannot agree on this conceptual definition of epistemology. Um, the profound reasons for that, I don't want to go into, in, in, into that here, but uh, what I can say is that uh, the most general definition of epistemology on which we can agree is the theory of knowledge. Epistemology is theory of knowledge. But then, the moment we begin to give content to this theory, and the one that they want to go into detail, well, of course, what is theory? Uh, then we start, uh, no? Uh, to be to, to differ from one another, to diverge uh, in our opinions. So, I think at the moment, in the present moment, um, epistemology, the modern Western epistemology is dominant. Uh, the Islamic one uh, is uh, marginalized, except uh, among uh, Muslims. Uh, even among Muslims, also sometimes uh, it is the Western definition that is dominant, right? But the Western definition or theory of knowledge is, uh, this is one of the definition and per perhaps this is a, uh, one of the most popular. Uh, the uh, epistemology is the, philo the philosophical study of the nature of knowledge, of the origin and limits of human knowledge. Uh, these are the three fundamental issues. Um, that with in Western epistemology. Now, but what about Islam? Yeah, actually, I can say here, based on uh, my 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 own understanding, based on my own knowledge, Islamic theory of knowledge is far broader than the uh, modern uh, definition of epistemology. So there are many issues. Um, that are considered as under epistemology in Islam, but are not regarded so, uh, are not regarded as part uh, of epi epistemology in the case of the Western uh, perspective, right? And just to start, for example, uh, um, on the question of definition, uh, the, or even just because you uh, just take, for example, uh, the three, uh, the three, uh, Aspects, the three aspects of uh, epistemology uh, treated by 
by the West. Right? It is the principle, the study of the nature uh, of, 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 of knowledge. So what is the nature of knowledge? Now, Muslim epistemologists throughout the centuries have dealt with this issue. So they came up with the, the idea that um, as a kind of the, uh, the uh, general uh, uh, the understanding of that uh, definition, which refers to the ta'arif, yeah? uh, definition is of two types. One is uh, what we call had, definition in the form of al had. Uh, you refer to the uh, essential, what 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 written in the, in by some uh, Muslims or some uh, authorities uh, in the modern language, they called had refers to the essential uh, meaning of uh, of knowledge, uh, whereas the other one is rasmun that is a descriptive. If you refer to the uh, the, the, the very popular book, uh, the uh, knowledge transfer uh, by Franz Rosenthal. Uh, he gives hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, definitions uh, of knowledge, but actually uh, those definitions refer not to had, but to ras the rasman is precisely, uh, it means uh, des description or specification of distinctive characteristic of the object defined. In the case of knowledge, uh, in other words, we can describe the characteristics of knowledge, but we cannot really uh, define and we cannot really, the real nature, yeah, or rather the nature of knowledge cannot really uh, be uh, make definitive. We can't do that. But the consolation, the consolation is that uh, knowledge is self evident truth. Uh, so when the Prophet Sallallahu said that knowledge is light, ilmu nur, right? the uh, ilm, knowledge is light, nur, all right? Uh, that is, um, uh, in a sense, it is, it is a, a description about, uh, about um, uh, knowledge, uh, but um, what sort of light, right? the against demand. In other words, we use the term then, uh, that the usage of that term demands us to uh, ask another question. We never satisfied. All right, you see, it's no, but uh, there's so many different forms of light. What what is this light? Is this is it physical? Is it tangible? Is it or intangible? Is it spiritual? Well, we know, and this is something which uh, Imam Al Ghazali, uh, Al Ghazali, uh, for example. Uh, uh, Described uh, in, in, in his uh, in his tafsir on the Allah uh, Nusama Watiwa out God is the light. Uh, this um, uh, the in his book uh, Mishkatul Anwar, uh, the niche of lies. He talks about the different types of light uh, from the physical, the lowest of the physical light to the uh, the absolute light, referring to God Himself, who is a Nur. Uh, all right, but. That's why Muslim uh, epistemologists say we cannot define in the sense of had because had requires us to um, to enclose in that to make the object define um, uh, the uh, definite that, that we can't do because uh, we define things by using knowledge. Now we are asked to define knowledge in terms of by means of knowledge. That is that that is not possible. So as far as the uh, Rasmun of knowledge, I say is that um, there are so many things you can describe about, uh, about knowledge. Uh, you say knowledge is uh, useful, knowledge is uh, very, uh, and, uh, knowledge uh, is both human and, and, and divine. So you can describe in a different way, but that is not definite. Uh, this is not discussed. This is not, uh, you don't have this kind of discussion uh, in the case of Western, uh, epistemology, where they, they try to define anything. They think they have defined uh, knowledge, but no, they have not really defined in the sense of, uh, of, of ahad. Now, the, the other one is origin, question of origin. Right? So because according to the Western definition, we have to talk about the, the origin of knowledge. 
of course, Islam has its own perspective on the origin of knowledge. You know very well, of course. Um, first of all, you know, knowledge is both divine and human attribute. That's very, very, very important. Right? Uh, in, the, in a sense, it is the foundation, one of the uh, foundational premises or assumptions of Islamic epistemology. Knowledge is both the, is both a divine attribute and a human attribute. And what, how to explain between these two? Uh, you can find a lot of discussion uh, in, in Islamic literature on, 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 on the subject, the, the connection between the divine attribute of knowledge and the human uh, attribute. Of course, in terms of origin, uh, the ultimate origin of knowledge is God, uh, who is the all-knowing, uh, the omniscient, uh, that's the ultimate origin. But how knowledge from this ultimate origin comes to the human soul, to the human mind, that is in so many different ways. So we had that, that principle, uh, God, and the knowledge is from God, but uh, it comes in different ways to the, uh, the, to the human uh, um, mind. Now I want to go to the, the next, next, next subject. Um, all right, the, the question of the Quran and epistemology. All right. I told you uh, epistemology is very, very important. Uh, certainly very important in Islam. I maintain that the most important field of knowledge, branch of knowledge uh, in the Islam is uh, uh, Tawheed, uh, science of the unity of God, the unity of the divine principle. But next to Tawheed, I would say epistemology is the most important. Right? Um, so everyone, every person must have some knowledge of epistemology. So if you ask me, uh, is epistemology uh, fardu ayn or fardu kifaya? Well, said it is the core epistemology. I would say it is fardu ayn fardu ayn because if you don't know uh, uh, about this the, this branch of knowledge, then you know that you don't know about the others. Now, so why? My question is, why is the Quran uh, interested in uh, epistemology? Why? Uh, well, the most important reason is the nature of Islam itself as a religion. Uh, I have often um, maintained in my lectures, in my talks, you know, I've emphasized this point that Islam is the religion of knowledge for excellence. Religion of knowledge for excellence. In other words, uh, it is essentially a region of knowledge. So if Islam is essentially a religion of knowledge, how can you ignore epistemology? You cannot ignore. So the, the Quran has to be interested because the Quran is about Islam. And, um, and then and related to this, of course, it's a status. You know that? So if Islam, if the Quran says that Islam is a religion of knowledge, then, and since the Quran is a book of guidance, then the Quran must have a lot to say about the um, uh, the about itself as a guide in knowledge activities about knowledge. So that's why you ask more than eight hundred times the triliteral word uh, "ain lam mean" related to knowledge in, in the Quran. You can imagine, yeah. Um, 800 and uh, I don't know how many, but more than 800 uh, occur, uh, occurrences in the Quran. Um, yeah. Oh, that word, that it, of that uh, triliteral word, which gives rise to the concept uh, of, of, of knowledge, right? So I want to emphasize this. But uh, then you ask, uh, how often we really consult the Quran uh, in this, as far as epistemology is concerned? I think um, not many, but yeah, but I think we should do more. I think um, uh, we should treat the Quran as uh, the most important source of reference for our knowledge about epistemology. Uh, 
Um, and of course, this is different from uh, quoting and just referring to some ayat, uh, some verses in the Quran that refers to knowledge. No, it's, it's, it's to have the, the whole picture of the Quran uh, as a book of, 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 of knowledge. Now, next question down to, uh, to, to, to see that. All right. So, yeah. So is the Quran an important source or reference for epistemological ideas? The answer is yes. Very, very important, actually important. And, um, and of course, it's not just a matter of theory. Right? The Quranic teachings on epistemology were put in, into practice, we put this implemented uh, right from day one that those teachings were, uh, were, uh, were revealed. Now, the Quran created a community, created uh, a civilization, and uh, certainly uh, the Quran provides ideas for the purpose of creating a knowledge culture. It's very, very important. Right? Islam has its own knowledge culture. Today, our Islamic knowledge culture is being impaired by so many, uh, so many negative uh, factors. In the sense that uh, the the, inter the integral epistemology, right? the integral knowledge culture that was once the pride of Islam, uh, then has become reduced, and diminished uh, on the um, certain uh, portion or certain segments of that uh, original culture uh, uh, survives. But it is important for us to revise uh, this, inshallah. Now, next I just want to go to the principles of uh, uh, is, uh, the Islamic epistemology. Uh, first, I just want to, um, to talk about, actually, I mean, the, what are the fundamental concepts in epistemology? Uh, this is very important. Uh, in the creation of Islamic epistemology, or rather in the formulation of Islamic epistemology, this is an important uh, idea. This is important uh, agenda, categorization. In the creation of uh, uh, an integral knowledge culture, we must say, in a sense that everything, everything, the organization of knowledge must begin with categorization. Right? Um, the, because let's say you compare uh, after it's knowledge, all right? Knowledge is uh, like an ocean. Ocean of meaning. Knowledge is a vast ocean of meaning. I mean, we say lautan tiada berpantai atau lautan tiada dasar. It is it is vast vast field because in in a sense it is God's knowledge. Yeah. So. How can we move forward? How can we progress? How can we create new uh, branches of knowledge? We can't unless we do categorization. Knowledge has to be, to be uh, understood in terms of categories. So the, the, for example, uh, we say that uh, reveal knowledge. So we take a segment or this name. Yeah. Divine knowledge covers everything, but for the purpose of uh, analysis by the mind, we do that categorization so that we come up with that term. And in contrast, we come up with human knowledge. So we categorize that. Um, in Islam, later on, we also call the what call this. Um, uh, we have the religious sciences or the uh, sciences of the Sharia, al ulum Sharia. That is act of categorization, all right? In the sense, we, uh, we 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 make a, a, a part of the knowledge specific. So we have al ulum al aqliya al ulum al aqliya these are categorizations of knowledge. Ilmu fardu ayn and fardu kifaya. That is categorization uh, of, of, of knowledge. So uh, if we study the world history of ideas, then we'll be able to see uh, this process of 
categorization because every civilization, even before Islam, to the Greeks, for example, the, the civilization of Aristotle and also they already categorized uh, uh, knowledge. The one Aristotle classified knowledge, that classification was based on certain categories of knowledge, All right. logical knowledge. So the uh, it's, it's, it's very important. And this is a, a process that has not ended. It's an ongoing process. So today, uh, the students, all right, you do your, you know, you, do, you, are, you are writing thesis, you are doing your research to write um, articles, to write uh, thesis, for example. Uh, you may have to categorize new, and you have to, to, you have to come up with new categories. The, the, the thing is, without categorization, um, the scholarship cannot uh, cannot go, yeah? cannot cannot move uh, uh, forward. There is development in knowledge because category of the something is called categorization. Now, definition. Next is definition. But you can only define after you have categorized. So when you have come up with uh, many different terms um, related to categories of knowledge, then you define them. Yes, you, you, we, say, we say just now, there's a such thing as human knowledge. Uh, what is our de de definition? We need to define to, in order to distinguish it from, uh, from uh, d d d divine knowledge. We have the term ulum and nakaliya, ulum and nakaliya. We have the fact that we have these two terms means that we have some idea about uh, their differences. So we have to define. So my point is, as a principle, as a principle, definition comes after categorization. Then after we have def the defined things, we know what we mean, then only we go to the next one, is classification of data. So classification is the third most important concept in, uh, in epistemology, very, very fundamental question. Let's say, for example, um, the, the, the question of data, because uh, when, you know, I always tell my student uh, when you write the, is uh, when you to write about a research methodology. Now, first of all, you have to answer the question: What are your data? Right? You are your initial. You are collecting data, but data also many different kinds. So you have to define those data. You have to categorize those data. You have to find them and then. Classify then. Let me give you an example. Uh, in philosophy of science, in modern philosophy of science, they have you do this empirical data. Whether it's in natural science or in social science, uh, they talk about empirical data. Data that are correct based on the sense perception, because this is the, the, the lowest level of, uh, uh, of data. Uh, Al Ghazali used the word hisia. Hisia. Uh, the, 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 the empirical uh, data, data of the census, right? Then he used the word, uh, inter you have the ra rational data, nakliyat, uh, and then you have the transmitted data, nakliyat. Uh, even you have the word, the word taklidat, at the end of the word, the data that we derive, uh, you know, we derive uh, based on authority. Now, taklid, he, here in, in the sense that the, the idea, the teaching that is derived from taklid. Uh, in my chapter on Al Ghazali, in my Tawhid and Sign, and let that, and, and also the, that's the view of Ibn uh, Arabi, you know, uh, taklid in itself is not necessarily is, is necessarily negative. Yeah, what is what we have to pay attention is not the taklid, but what sort of taklid uh, uh, the in, in instance in, in the ideas that are being uh, received. Is, are they true or not? Because um, that lead can, can lead to both uh, good things or uh, bad things. But in terms of epistemology, the word that lead is really in a positive sense. It's based on authority. So then, from, the, from this perspective, actually, the Quran is based on that, you know, it, I mean, we follow the Quran based on that lead in the sense that based on the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the authority of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah? Uh, so the, we have to, to, to understand it in the epistemological context. Yeah? It's not necessarily, uh, but we know that we are, uh, some of us 
uh, criticizing some people you know, simply just based on the false authority. Uh, all right, next one. The, so now from concept, we go to precepts. All right. In other words, it's, these are just examples. It's not exhaustive. Yeah? I can't do this in, the, the, in such a uh, short uh, period of, uh, of, of uh, time, but we must know, all right? What, what are the uh, principles, some of the important principles uh, in uh, epistemology, particularly now, of course, talking about from the Islamic perspective. Uh, this principle is, very, uh, is the one to one correspondence between the knower, uh, sometimes we refer to subject, the self that knows, yeah? the knower, and the known. The knower, uh, alien, and the known, uh, marum, right? So the, you have the subject. The subject that knows, and the object that is known. One to one correspondent. Um, Aristotle uh, advanced this methodological principle, only the like can know the like, meaning that the nature of the cognitive instrument in the knower that is operative will depend on the nature of the object that is being known. I think the, the, the was called, was, what I refer to as one to one correspondence between the knower and the known. The knower is uh, an hierarchical, yeah? the, 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 uh, the instruments of knowledge, the, the cognitive organs in the human person, uh, is, and they, they are in a hierarchy. So that is also the nature of the objective world that you want to know. The objective world outside, for example, the, the, the creation. So uh, it's ridiculous to know God, uh, to know God through uh, other than spiritual, uh, spiritual cognitive uh, organ, because God is spiritual. In fact, is uh, absolutely spiritual, absolute compared to the uh, the relative spiritual, such as the the angel. The angels are spiritual, but relative at the reality uh, of, of of God. So when the followers of Musa uh, alayhi salam wanted to see God, you know, by means of the physical senses, I mean, they were doomed, okay? Because that, that is going against the nature, the nature of things. The point here, uh, if we want to know the physical world, we will use our physical senses. If you want to know about the imaginal world, uh, the world of the mind, the, 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 uh, the world of insan that, uh, that can be imagined, all right? Uh, this has to be known through the, Im the imaginal or the imaginative uh, faculty. And then if you want to uh, know about the intellectual and spiritual world, then we have to know it through our intellect reason. And to, again, also, we have to know through the heart, for example. So that's what I mean by one-to-one -one, uh, 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 cor correspondence. This means Once we know the nature of the objects of study, then we can decide what is our methodology. So our methodology must be uh, must be in, in proportion, must be in 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 in, uh, in, in uniformity, in in in, uh, in harmony with the nature of the, the things they want to know. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, the uh, particular sub, uh, the object of study can be known. By means of more than uh, one the, uh, one method, by means more than the use of more uh, cognitive instrument, uh, that, that that depends. Uh, but the point is, uh, in order to write to do research on some particular subject, we have to ask the question: What is the objective nature of that subject? And then now, in order to study that, responding. Uh, uh, the the what called cognitive uh, organs that they are going to use. All right. Now the next one is question of very very imp important principle of the unity of knowledge. This is basic to Islam because 
this is the corollary of the concept or the principle of unity of God, unity of the divine principle. Knowledge, real knowledge, two pieces of real knowledge cannot be in, contradic uh, in contradiction uh, to each other. So guided by that uh, confidence, by that certainty, uh, knowledge cannot be opposed to each other. Right? Different branches of knowledge cannot be opposed. In fact, this idea of unity of knowledge plays a very important role in research. Uh, in Islam, so we we, we are look knowledge as just one vast uh, ocean interrelated. The idea is that the truth of things, knowledge of things, in one discipline. Uh, when we want to, to to do our our research, the principle, uh, so there cannot be contradiction between unity, between knowledge of religion and um, natural science. It cannot be conflict with, with social science. Uh, if we come to a contradiction, then we need to examine. But one is there cannot be. So if there is, then there's something wrong somewhere. And we will investigate that uh, and correct the, the, the situation. And then of course, the other one is of course the principle of the hierarchy of knowledge. Um, the various branches of knowledge are regarded as, as, regarded as branches of the same tree, of a single tree, hierarchy. Uh, even just now, I talk about hierarchy of the uh, cognitive uh, uh, organs, instruments uh, in our soul, right? Uh, and uh, uh, there's hierarchy of that, but we talk about hierarchy of the uh, in, in term, what what is meant by this uh, idea of hierarchy is that. Um, Sciences, different sciences are not necessarily on the same level, the same footing, in the same. Uh, one science can be viewed as more fundamental than another, or more important than another, of course, based on certain uh, criteria. I have explained this uh, concept uh, uh, in details in my book, uh, Classification of Knowledge in Islam. These two principles, unity and hierarchy. In fact, uh, my, my critique of the uh, Islamization of knowledge that, um, you know, that started with the uh, Makkah conference in the 1977 and for, for, uh, for a generation, for 30 years, fine, I mean, uh, but somehow then we got stuck. Uh, we got stuck. Uh, and I think, and when let's say 30 years after the Maka uh, conference, people, we are still talking of uh, more of the same thing. But one important uh, issue that was not tackled, that's not certain, is this whole elemental structure of a science. Every science that deserves to be called science is comprised of four elements. The structure is made up of these four elements. First, subject matter. So if we study psychology, what is the subject matter of psychology? So the that has to be examined first, the sense. But obviously, the subject matter of Islamic psychology is much, much broader uh, than the uh, modern psychology uh, parts of the of the subject matter have been taken out because um, from the Islamic perspective, uh, psychology is the study of the soul, right? Uh, but when the term, uh, when the uh, soul is taken out of that and is replaced by something else, then we have to examine. So what is it in the traditional classical Muslim classic and uh, notion of soul uh, has been taken out, has been relegated, has been marginalized, uh, yeah, the point is, uh, if one, in other words, Islamization of psychology in particular and science in, in general have to look at the issue of subject matter, the maudu, then and that has to be done. Now, the second one is foundational assumption. Every 
The contention here is that every field of knowledge, every science, every science, whether religious, whether social or natural, is based upon certain assumptions. Certain assumptions. Without those assumptions, we cannot proceed with that science. So every science has done. So that's why the, the, the first generation of people who try to formulate, to, 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 to explain uh, the, the, the new science created, they tell what were the assumptions. Yeah. So the whether it's in physics, biology, or astronomy, or sociology, and, and so on. Now, Islamization therefore has to address. All right. Are these assumptions correct? Are these assumptions sufficient uh, or not? I want to share with you my experience in the in two thousand and seven. Um, I was part of a group uh, of uh, scholars presenting the different religion. Only only seven of us. Was, we had a, a, a one week one week uh, you know uh, brainstorming in in the uh, this uh, Japan in in, in Japan. Uh, we our, our job simple then to examine the foundational assumptions of modern science. We wanted we were interested to find out. How many of these assumptions are still valid? And we found out that more than half are no longer valid in the light of new uh, advancements in in, in uh, the uh, another portion uh, still valid. Another portion uh, needs to be uh, revised. Not 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 invalid, but in other words, needs to be uh, reformulated. Uh, this is very very important. Uh, as well, all right? Because uh, we have been doing, we have been studying in that branch of knowledge without questioning the foundation on which that science is based. Yeah? Uh, it's as if that we are staying in a house, all right? Uh, for 50 years, we stayed in the house. We never look at the, uh, at the, at the, the, the foundation of the house, whether it is, uh, no, is this still strong? Or still already uh, you know, ravaged by termites and, and, and so on. You can, we, have, we have to examine. Uh, of course, this is the work of epistemologists. The work of epistemologists is uh, the, and the other one, of course, is methodology. Very important principle in Islamic epistemology is that no, and it is, and it, uh, there's no single methodology that is applicable to every science. Different sciences employ different methodology. So it would be wrong to impose a uniform methodology on all disciplines. It's going against uh, the nature of uh, epistemology. This, this is very important. All right? It is in the West. It is the modern West that, in, that uniformize this. See? You must use the scientific method. The, 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 the term is scientific method. If you don't use the scientific method according to their definition, According to the characterization, then it's not valid. Then it's not valid. We, and it, but that's not the case. Re, religious sciences, right? Theology needs different methods. Mathematics also needs its own, own in this own method. Sociology needs its method. Uh, the study of cognitive intelligence needs its, its own method. The medicine its own methods. Right? So this, the, the nature of this will determine what is the appropriate methodology. And of course, the, 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 the fourth element is the end. What is the objective of the study? Yeah. So what is the objective of sociology? What is the objective of medicine? What is the objective of, of, of physics? Every branch of science has its own epistemological goal, the immediate goal. Of course, the longer term goal, the general goal is, uh, it is not, it's, it's useful to society. So it's not enough to say that every science, the aim is to serve society, of course it's to serve society, but the more epistemological aim, which is the, the, the one that's uh, uh, nearer to mine, in other words, what does that particular science hope to achieve, to prove? What does it want to prove, want to show, understand that? What body of truth does that science want 
to establish. Uh, I think this, this is a, a very important um, uh, set in epistemology. Well, finally, I just want to go to the, uh, what's the time now? I'm uh, three fifty six. Now it's uh, three fifty six, bro. Yeah, you give uh, me I think five can minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, five or uh, yeah. uh, ten minutes. Uh, now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Talking about all this, I mean, the, for what? I mean, that's why I, I have one heading here: uh, applied epistemology. So. Of course, we must understand for uh, this the theoretical part of this epistemology, the, the theory. But now we have to apply that, yeah. Uh, and uh, I can only again mention here some some examples. Uh, it's own my area, my own area of uh, uh, specialization, for example, uh, different criteria of classification. Um, epistemology is applied to the study of classification of knowledge. Um, and in my, in my book, Classification of Knowledge in Islam, uh, would show clearly uh, in what way uh, epistemology uh, has been applied to that uh, subject of study. Uh, and uh, it is important to know, of course, then uh, there are different criteria of classification uh, resulting in different classification because empirically we know very well that Islamic civilization we encounter a uh, different classification. So rather than saying that um, uh, these people are contradictory to each other, no, they are not. It's just that they are using, they were using different criteria for different purposes. Uh, what I did in the in, in my book, Classification of Knowledge in Islam, I um, consider three uh, major criteria, right? The ontological uh, the, the, uh, uh, criteria, the methodological criteria, and the ethical uh, criteria, viewed from the viewpoint of ethics. Uh, and I give an example to divide science to classify science and knowledge into in Mufadu'ain and Fubi Kafaya, that is based on ethical criteria. Right? Now, uh, I want to just, the, 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 the few minutes of, uh, uh, few minutes that I have, my, my slides, are uh, applying epistemology to thesis writing, to article writing, uh, I just want to show you uh, how relevant the Quran is, even, even um, on this aspect. So I just want to talk about the significance of Al-Fatiha for epistemology in general and thesis writing in particular. For example, the importance of uh, definition, the importance of definition. Where is it? Where is it that you have this concept of definition in the, uh, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the definition. Well, uh, the concept of Siratul Mustaqim, the straight the, 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 the straight path. The straight path, of course, is a categorization. First of all, it is categorization. The Quran categorizes uh, a path which he calls the straight path. But not only categorized in the, the Surah Al-Fatiha, but it was also defined. Defined both in both senses, had and Rasul. In the sense that the essence of the uh, Surah Al-Mustaqim was defined. And then the characteristics of that Surah Al-Mustaqim also defined. Now, the uh, that part, well, that part of the definition, which conforms uh, to the right, to the essential, the essential definition is in the Nasirat al not just before that is Iya kana abudu wa Iya kana stain. Two things. All right, our commitment. We commit ourselves 
that we want to serve, we want to worship Allah alone, and we want to seek help from Him alone. Um, so I'm saying definition of Siratul Mustaqim is the worship of one God. The, that, the, the, that is that path. The straight path is the path which in, in which the worship of God alone uh, is, 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 is performed. I, I verified that by going to all the other places in the Quran where the word Siratul Mustaqim is mentioned. And by consulting all the other verses on, on that, it confirms that. It confirms that essential definition. Right? Then in terms of the rasm, the description, well, Sirat, it explains that. What is Sirat al-Mustaq, Sirat al-Mustaqim? Sirat al-Ladzina an'amta alayhim ghayr al-mawdubi alim al-dhalim. So, there you have what is being affirmed as Sirat al-Mustaqim and what is negated of Sirat al-Mustaqim. What is affirmed of Sirat al-Mustaqim is, is the part on those, on the on blessings uh, 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 given. Yeah? Sirat al-Ladzina an'amta alayhim ghayr al-mawdubi alim al-dhalim. Then the, the one, uh, the that one you have the what well, is negated of certain Muslim. This is a very, very beautiful epistemological uh, idea. So, in other words, um, the Quran provides us a model here. Yeah? And is, do, we, do we hear in, 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 in Surah, in surah Fatiha? The, uh, the, the mother, uh, the mother of the book. All right? uh, so, the, the, that's the first thing from that. Now the the other one is of course it's it's classification. You have that classification, all right? Uh, you have the, the the classification because then uh, based on the 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 the, uh, the path of those who are uh, the who have been granted comfort uh, with uh, the uh, blessings and the nama and those who are the the, the or who have. Uh, the who have deviated, and the other one who has who's rest, who, uh, the God's rest is, is on, on them. So the, um, in other words, uh, it is it is it, it, it provides ideas there. The other one is of course is about um, um, it is said that Al Fatiha is the summary of 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 of, of the Quran, all right? The, the the summary of the Quran. What you call you know in, in, in writing thesis you write abstract you write uh, 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 what is the abstract abstract is supposed to to be that concise summary uh, of your of, of your thesis right? uh, often I find that the abstract sometimes uh, given by some by some student do not really capture do not really capture the whole uh, of the thesis in other words, yeah. Uh, this is, you can imagine if, if I say yeah, uh, the Fatiha, the Al Fatiha is the summary of the whole Quran, the essential summary. The whole Quran from Surah Al Baqarah until uh, chapter 114, yeah, uh, that is. The whole of the Quran. What sort of what sort of summary do you have? That's it. The instruction to you in seven sentences. Right? In seven sentences, will you get the same seven seven sentences at Al Fatiha? No, only God. God, the author, God, uh, from whom the Quran comes. He knows. So he summarized in the most perfect manner. So then, in the sense that the whole of the Quran is contained in the Fatiha. Uh, all right, and then just, just to the, in, in terms of the significance. So, uh, and then the analysis and thesis. Uh, 
analysis and synthesis is a, a, a very two important facets of our of our mind. Uh, so in a test in a thesis, uh, we need both analysis and synthesis in a sense. Um, that basically uh, synthesis occurs twice, one in the abstract and the other in the conclusion. All right. In a sense, we are synthesizing. Yeah? After having uh, written the thesis, now we want to write an abstract. Uh, it's basically how to come up with a, synth with a synthetical uh, viewpoint. Yeah? In the sense that your whole thesis is summarized in the synthesis. The synthesis has captured the most important things that you want to say. Nothing is, 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 is omitted. But uh, that demands an art, it's an art. Right? That is an art of, uh, of, of, of doing synthesis. You cannot achieve synthesis unless you are able to, uh, you know, to combine your ideas into uh, more inclusive concepts. Because But synthesis, how we, we have to come up with inclusive uh, terminology, inclusive concepts that capture the, 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 the details. So this art, of course, this is an art that we improve through practice, right? So the more the more often we write, um, the better we do in doing. Uh, analysis and synthesis, but one it is very important dimension of uh, thesis writing. I mentioned that uh, uh, because I'm telling you, uh, no, uh, many students have not done well in uh, in writing and in conclusion. I'm talking about the, the last conclusion. Some people may do conclusions in the uh, each chapter. Producing, no, the producing what you have written differently. But what I would call here creative conclusion, creative, right? Yes, it is a form of uh, uh, summarizing. You in uh, you have, you write seven chapters. Now you want to capture again what, what what have you what what are your findings in different chapters? But out of those, you have to come with something creative also. You have to see. Uh, to be creative here means to see, to be able to see uh, what is the significance of your finding, the significance of your conclusion. First of all, to your own field of study, because that, should, that is the, the, the first important thing. What do people, your colleagues in other, uh, in, in the same field, uh, get to benefit from this? What for the research can be uh, can be can be. Uh, what, of what has been achieved in your field. This, this is a very, very, uh, very, very, very important thing. Uh, that's why in the beginning already, when you do your uh, thesis proposal, for example, uh, in the, in the, as the background, the general, uh, no, the, uh, the background, you should already have some, some uh, you should be doing some survey of the, uh, what has been achieved in the same field uh, of study. Without that knowledge, uh, you know, the, your, you, you have an issue, you know, because this is, is about an issue. You start, your, you, you come up with a topic based on the issue in which you are interested, but that issue has to be contextualized, uh, has to be viewed in the context of the discipline, academic discipline. Uh, that Okay. Uh, of course, I, you should also observe ethics of knowledge, which is part of epistemology here. Yeah? Ethics of knowledge. Um, do I, I can only want I want to to to, to advise or uh, to give to give advice to our younger students, which is against the teaching of of, of the Quran. Uh, what else, what I understand what the Quran says, uh, Bill Huck. Uh, to be objective, first of all, means to be sincere. To be sincere and to be truthful. So what do you mean being objective in the Islamic context? 
it means to be sincere, at last, and to be truthful. So we are dedicated to the truth. Uh, so the uh, by the end of the the end of your your, your study, you have uh, served this purpose. Now the other one, of course, is to do epistemological justice. The you should do justice to the subject you study or to authors you, 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 you have cited in your works, all right? So when we choose a particular topic for, uh, for our thesis, please bear this in mind. Please ask yourself, am I doing justice to the subject, to the topic that I've chosen now? very end. That alone in 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 three, in three years. So this epistemological justice is important, all right? Uh, to, so the, that that um, kind of ability, that sense uh, of uh, you know, justice in terms of uh, paraphrasing an author and quoting an author. I'm saying that quotation is better, superior to the person. I find that sometimes I check uh, this person, this uh, candidate, uh, paraphrase an author. But the paraphrase uh, is, uh, is not what the author meant, all right? So we are not doing justice to the author. So we are on the surface side if we quote what that author, what that scholar said. That scholars, the author's own words. We don't get the quotation rather than paraphrasing, putting the name of the book and the year published, but actually is that not what the author meant? Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, avoiding useless knowledge. Uh, you, know, you should learn to know what is useless knowledge and uh, to avoid uh, plagiarism. Uh, now you have the means. We have the technical means to check you know, whether you are uh, doing position uh, or not. So, okay, Prof, uh, thank you very much, you know. Uh, roughly what, what I wanted to say, uh, I hope that I have raised certain epistemological issues that um, will lead you, some, uh, some of you, uh, to give a uh, deep thought uh, reflection. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof uh, Usman, for the uh, enlightening um, lecture on epistemology and, uh, and not just theory but uh, practice of it in the um, in the um, uh, theoretical uh, framework of coming and writing uh, the thesis eh? especially PhD thesis um, we value your contribution in this um, but uh, I, uh, I do have my fear that there are some participants who enter the room uh, last minute, maybe they did not get the whole crux of the lecture except the tail of the lecture. So what I could say is just like, uh, it, it seems like much knowledge for those who came in uh, late, yeah? Uh, well, we have about uh, 15 minutes left for question and answers. Uh, we could not entertain all, but I guess those uh, questions in the chat uh, will be entertained. And uh, we try to sit some of the questions so that uh, Prof, you can answer them. Uh, there are, yeah, there are a few questions. If I can uh, hand over to, um, to Brother Shahran, because I could not see the questions, Brother Shahran. Okay, bro. Yeah. Uh Yes, thank you, Brother Sharan. Okay, yes. bro. Uh, the first one uh, from Brother Kustan uh, from Bogor. How should we determine which textual sources that we should cite in the form of a paraphrase and which one that we should quote directly? Paraphrase may simply a bit different meaning to our readers. Well, I'm not saying that it is haram. Uh, to paraphrase, no, 
uh, by means uh, continue, but I said it, it, it depends on our on our ability, our ability, our grasp of, of what the, the author uh, uh, has said. If we think that uh, I'm here, I'm, I'm what my voice is that that if uh, I said certainly uh, the quote is better, right? Wherever it is appropriate to do the, uh, the quotation, especially on something on an issue which uh, may be mis easily be misunderstood, you know. Uh, to, to avoid misunderstanding, to avoid that we are doing injustice. My point is doing injustice, daughter. This is the, the this is the spirit we learn from from ilm hadith, the hadith, you know, the isnad. You, see? you, you, you know, it, it's very important that we do not um, uh, introduce uh, words, you know, that was not used by the the, the, the original uh, speaker. So the science of hadith methodology. Is very important as, 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 as a guide. All right, we quote, right? Uh, the, but if we think that, yeah, as, as long as you can avoid that, by all means, yeah, sometimes, no, you just want to paraphrase, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the Hello? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Then... Start there. Okay, brother Shah, uh, right? I don't know. The, the, connection, the, connection, the connection here is not stable. It doesn't look yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It, the connection is not stable as well on my side. Yeah. But, uh, Prof, uh, again, uh, a follow up of the uh, paraphrasing. Um, if you are proposing that uh, quotation are made, but there's also a regulation, Prof. Uh, I, I guess most of the universities. They have uh, regulations in uh, quotation, in using quotation. Uh, I guess it's not more than 30% because they run through uh, some softwares to ensure that a uh, certain number of uh, percentage of um, quotations. So what is your take on that, Rob? Don't, uh, there, there's, there, there's no point, yeah? Uh, in other words, Quotations are minimal, are minimal, where, necess where necessary. Huh? Uh, so we still observe the 30% limitation. Yeah, 230 percent is already a lot. Uh, it's already a, a lot to, to, to quote. Uh, but, yeah. but rather than uh, rather than uh, not disallowing altogether, uh, because I heard in some places they, they disallow that altogether. Just uh, uh, no, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, the, especially in the case of Islamic studies, in the case of the uh, social sciences, uh, it's different than, than the technical subject, natural sciences. I mean, sometimes uh, we need to quote. We need to do to, to the full quotation. Yeah. Especially yeah. when- so There's one uh, important question here uh, from Del Inspiron to everyone. Yeah? Assalamualaikum Prof. Osman. Can a psychological knowledge apply to Islamic knowledge? Because in most cases, it contradicts Islamic teaching. Can psychological knowledge? Can a psychological knowledge apply Islamic knowledge? Because in most cases, it contradicts Islamic teaching. Uh, I have to do some... Um, some critical analysis of your question. <laughs> yeah, okay. this question is from a brother. Yeah, from because be, yeah. because now you, you uh, I I do not take I do not take as just uh, take it just like that. When you use the, you use the term psychological knowledge, mm -hmm. and then you use and then you use Islamic knowledge. No, mm. the categorization is wrong. Mm. Uh, I think the categorization Islamic knowledge is wrong. And a lot of Muslims doing this wrong thing. There is no such thing as Islamic knowledge mm. and un-Islamic knowledge. Uh. All knowledge, all true knowledge is Islamic. And that's why we don't use the word adjective Islamic knowledge. Mm. Huh? Knowledge cannot be false. Knowledge is something that is true.
and by some other names, not knowledge. Mm. Okay. Uh, so the so the uh, differentiation between psychological knowledge and some knowledge is not correct. But I know what you mean. Mm. You want to know whether mm. we can uh, make use of psychological knowledge, which I assume to be true knowledge. Yes, mm. because um, uh, psychological knowledge in psychology, in sociology, in politics, in physics, and so on, if they are true, then they affirm the truth of a Tawhid, the unity of the divine principle. They affirm the truth of Islam, and therefore it is Islamic. Hmm. Yeah. So therefore, okay, uh, question is, from, uh, from, then, uh, hmm? yeah. from Imam Kanafi, uh, in Arabic, there are many terms about knowledge. Uh, so he gave an example of al-ilmu, al-ma'rifa, al-hikmah, al-hakikat. Can you please explain to me or to all the participants? that terms in the from the perspective of western epistemology these are fundamental issues in epistemology that have been addressed by many scholars uh, i mentioned or the professor said muhammad nakil an atas uh, i can mention some of said hossein nasr ismail faruqi and uh, uh, others al uh, al badri all these have, have, have done this, right? have, have addressed uh, this. Now, of course, if you are a linguist, uh, if you want to do research in more detail, for example, what is the difference between Ain and Ma'rifa? Mm. Mm. Yes, you can do that. You see context, how, how Islamic literature, yeah? So if you read, for example, of the uh, Arabic, uh, the, the Lales of uh, Edward Lales, uh, uh, Arabic uh, English lexicon, for example, he will produce uh, the evidence from the, the whole literature since in, in, throughout the city of Islam. Why is it different? Why is the subtle difference? Why is the subtle difference between N and Marifa? There is a difference, but very subtle. It's just like in Malay, in Bahasa Melayu, there's a difference, subtle difference between Tahu and Kenal. So the same, yeah? You may tahu somebody, but you don't know that. You really don't know. Yeah? Uh, so, so, something like that. The analogy of Ain and Marifa is the, uh, the difference between tahu and kenal. Oh. So There's one more question. You know, the, the, my, my point is, uh, Pro, my point is, yeah. It doesn't mean that. All those categories have been understood correctly. And this is where today our, our, our role. If you want to study, study. All right. So, for example, this term um, uh, or the uh, olum and not Yeah. 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 So that we must study. No? You use the term, but we don't really analyze the concept. What is really the concept of the ulum al akliya or the ulum al naklia? Uh, yeah, we need to examine this. We can look. Uh, we can look at our history of ideas and try to see uh, where something has gone wrong. Something like yeah, uh, has, has has happened or not? Uh, okay. There's one question, Prof, from Brother Tahi Ahmad. I am a mathematician. Is Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry are two pieces of knowledge that contradict to each other? Euclidean? Euclidean. Non -Euclidean. And non -Euclidean. Non -Euclidean. Yeah. It's my old friend uh, Zahra. Uh, <laughs> he's a mathematician. Um, well, I, I, I uh, mentioned in my uh, article on the this um, Ibn, or this Omar Khayyam, uh, Omar Khayyam's um, critique of the Euclidean geometry. You know? In fact, uh, uh, there I showed uh, he went further, uh, you know, 
uh, he talked on about system uh, geometry. It, it, that is not, first of all, as a matter of principle, uh, there is no contradiction between uh, Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, the, the, um, uh, it is a possibility, all right? Because uh, there have also been some Muslim uh, philosophers uh, of science uh, who mention or who, who, who argue that the uh, Euclidean geometry uh, corresponds to the uh, the ordinary world of our of our perception, the physical, the, our physical world, um, just as we have a logic, a system of logic uh, that corresponds to the, our ordinary experience. Right? Uh, it's the same thing happens to geometry. Uh, it is possible to think of a geometrical geometric system in the, in the uh, in the world beyond uh, the, the, the physical world world of, 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 of other, other, other dimension. But for our purpose, for our at the elementary level, uh, and the, uh, physics, for example, also, so we, uh, we accept, uh, we accept this. But uh, philosophers have, have also looked at the limitation. What are the limitations of the Euclidean uh, mathematics, Euclidean uh, geometry? My, 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 my answer to the question is uh, not necessary. Not necessarily in contraction, unless we can pinpoint to some particular uh, elements and some, uh, some something in particular that we can can show that it is uh, contradictory to uh, Islamic science, to Islamic mathematics. More importantly, to Islamic mathematics. Okay. Oh, uh, there are too many questions coming in, Prof. I'm not quite sure whether we could entertain all. Uh, perhaps this is all the more reason to have part two of the <laughs> epistemology. Uh, but I, I think uh, we could entertain one last question before we end at um, 4.30 from uh, Fadil. Uh, Prof, you mentioned that the unity of knowledge means that, means that no two knowledges can contradict each other. Yes. If I understand correctly. Yes. How do we apply this to the apparent divergence between Newtonian and quantum physics, particularly with regards to the motion of matter? Now that's all, Prof, the question. Yeah, thank you. The question is related to the question on the, the previous question on the Euclid, right? Um, yeah. As I said, uh, based on the, our world, of experience. Now, Newtonian physics is based on so many assumptions. Going back to the concept of fundamental uh, assumptions in, 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 in modern science, um, Newtonian physics is true in the context of certain, based, based on, on, on those assumptions. Yeah? So it's based on our uh, the experience of our ordinary uh, perception, experience in the you know how. Uh, it, first of all, for example, Newton PC is based on the assumption that we are on a on a stationary planet. Okay? We are studying motions of a physical law based on the assumption that the Earth is not moving. That is assumption. But quantum physics is different. Yeah. Quantum physics is based on the assumption that everything is in motion. You know very well, the Earth is moving, revolving around the sun, all right? And not only that, while revolving around the sun, it also rotates around its own, its own axis. You have double, uh, uh, double motion, yeah? It, it's, it's, uh, some, it's, it's something like, uh, uh, we, are, we, we are riding on a train, we would be observing things as the train is, uh, is moving compared to we observe but we're staying uh, on, 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 on this spot. So it's not that the uh, quantum, uh, quantum physics is wrong, no. But quantum physics has to be understood in a different context, in, 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 in different context. We have, so that's why uh, 
quite differently uh, from some people in the West who discarded Newtonian physics in favor of uh, quantum physics. Islamic philosophers and will say that um, both are true, but they have different the the the, the, no? the parameters parameters for each uh, physics uh, different the uh, context is different the assumptions uh, uh, are, are, are correct. Um, I don't to go into detail on that. I mean, to, we have to go into the question. For example, uh, the, uh, the question: If I say, "All right, now uh, I have here, uh, I hold my uh, my phone here," uh, I say, "The phone uh, is in a solid state." Nobody can can deny this. All right, uh, this phone is in a solid. It, it, it's a solid. It is, it is solid. It is not liquid. It is not gas. It is. It is, it is solid, all right? So if somebody who said that, it will be wrong. But then if a physicist, a quantum physicist can say, no, no, I said, I, instead of seeing a solid, I can see the atoms the, uh, of your phone are now dancing, you know? Uh, no, around. Then he's not wrong also, yeah? He's not wrong. But they are, they are making the statements from different viewpoints. So this phone is both a solid and not solid, you know. It is it is static as well as moving. It's dynamic in a nice mistake. You have to do now from which perspective there we are making our statement. Okay, that's what I have, uh, Professor. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof Osman, for answering uh, all those questions. Although um, there is a queue of questions actually, because you have opened a Pandora box. <laughs> Questions for our uh, young younger scholars. Uh, inshallah, perhaps I will follow up with uh, Prof uh, for part two because it seems that those in the social sciences are also interested, but we uh, interested in applying uh, epistemology with uh, social sciences instead of uh, hard sciences. You know, we've been entertaining questions from mathematicians from. Uh, from the perspective of um, physics, yeah, basically hard sciences. Um, but what we'll do, um, uh, we hope all our uh, younger scholars will be patient. We will try to arrange for some more uh, along the same line, Prof, because uh, we don't want to like uh, 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 cut and paste the knowledge if it, the depth is not there. So at least there is a certain breadth and depth of the topic for them to really understand. So that's it. So thank you very much. We really uh, appreciate your contribution, Prof. And in fact, uh, we are taking in um, more uh, suggestions and proposals from our participants today, uh, just for this particular topic so that uh, uh, we could get Prof. Osman to clarify further on areas that has um, been causing some uh, uh, gray areas, I would say gray areas for them, not gray areas for Prof. Osman, gray areas for them, so that they could apply that in their thesis. So I think for those doing uh, PhD, um, uh, it's more on like guiding hand for them. For the undergraduates, perhaps it's, it's an exposure. For those doing masters, is trying to understand the issue. As Prof mentioned, that this is the uh, elementary perspective for them. Uh, here, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So we hope uh, we would like to thank everybody for their time in following this uh, one and a half hours of uh, lecture by Prof Osman Bakar. We hope to hear more from him. Uh, uh, from the uh, writing lab at ISTEC. So, inshallah, we will try to get uh, as many as possible to join us in our next uh, part two of epistemology. Um, and um, uh, we hope to get uh, the time from Prof. Osman. So, before I end, I would like to say thank you, uh, especially to Brother Shahran, who has been helping me technically in this. Um, uh, though this is the first time we're having this, I guess, uh, we hope to get a more number of students to come in. Please spread the word and share uh, because uh, it is 
basically free, but that doesn't mean that it is not useful. You know, because some people say, uh, if it's free, then therefore it's not good. No, you know, this is, uh, these are series of lectures by renowned scholars. Huh? So the first would be eight professors uh, who are in the field more than 30 years. For, Prof, for example, for Prof Osman, this is his 40th year. So um, it's good to share uh, with him and uh, his knowledge um, and we hope to see you all soon. So thank you very much everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.